。然后下一个为我们分享的是 Lee t u p t 他呃，他将为我们介绍多项速度，还有其七个基本概念。然后我们三点呃，我们两点三十分准时开始。我先简单介绍一下这个呃 Lee t u p t 他是他的绰号是 The Speed Guy， 他主要，呃，他也是多项认证课程的作者，包括 NSPA 的呃 Speed and Agility， 然后还有 Speed Insiders， 还有呃 Certificated Basketball Speed Specialist， 呃 Complete Speed， 还有 Tennis Insider。这个这位呃教练，他主要是以提高速度能力为主，啊、呃，他之前也执教过很多运动员，包括 NBA、CBA 的一些运动员，还有那个呃 MLB 的一些运动员，以及呃呃一些网球运动员，然后也曾经参加过很多的主题演讲与呃研讨会。Hey, hello. My name is Lee Taft, and I want to thank you for having me be a guest and to share some information on、uh, my program on speed development. You know, I want to thank the you know the Shanghai COVID-19 online conference、uh, committee and also the Shanghai Research Institute of Sports Science for hosting this and having me be a guest. So let me go ahead and I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so now let's get ourselves set here. All right. So my topic is going to be multi-directional speed、uh, concepts and the seven fundamental patterns. So we're going to take you through,、um, you know, my concepts of how I train, address, and assess speed. Okay. So who am I? First of all, I'm the youngest of six uh, children. Uh, there's、uh, three brothers and three sisters. We all were pretty much teachers and coaches,、uh, administrators in school.、Uh, my father coached for 44 years. He coached, you know, football and basketball, track and field, baseball, and he was a physical preparation coach、uh, also in、uh, the war. And so he's had a lot of experience of it. And then my brothers、uh, coached for 33, 34 years. They've won state championships. They've played. You know a lot of sports, and、uh, they were physical education teachers as well. And then my sisters were teachers, and one of my teachers was a cosmetologist, so dealt with makeup and hair. And but they all played sports. And then me, I played four sports in high school, played two in college,、um, and I coached six different sports as well as being a phys ed teacher and a strength coach.、Um, so my business involves my family. So here's you know my children when they were really young. Uh, having some fun here. Here's my son in my garage, jumping around. This is when he was probably three, four years old. And here's my daughter doing the functional movement screen test. One of them. And then here's my oldest daughter, who's now 24 years old, doing a functional movement test. This was she was just a little girl, maybe seven years old, six, seven years old. Okay, so let's set the foundation. Uh, learning、uh, the learning approach that we use for speed development is we look at how do the athletes learn, okay? How do the coaches actually teach, and then what kinds of feedback do we give, and then strategies to develop athletic speed, okay? So do we abide by learning principles when we coach? In other words, do we do the things? That we know are going to help our athletes learn better, and that's really, really important in my system.、Um, do we foster a growth or a fixed mindset of learning in our athletes? In other words, do we make our athletes feel like they can't get any better, or do we provide an environment where they feel like they can get better and they can learn and grow? If we always yell at them, they become less likely to learn. If we If we help them and support them and understand them, they're more likely to know that they can get better, and that's that's very important.、Um, do the athletes' athletic skills transfer to performance? Okay, so do they understand?、Uh, do they have good experiences, and do they have a representation of those that allow them to learn? Okay, that's what this this 
chart is describing that learning transfer. You have to have an understanding of the experiences, and then that has to represent something so that it can transfer to performance. Okay, so learning. Uh, we learn best when we're at an age of comfort zone and challenge to solve problems in that moment with slight pressure. Okay, if we have too much pressure, young kids won't learn very well. Okay, so it has to be just a moderate bit of pressure so they feel like they, you know, they, they get a little bit challenged, but they don't want to have too much pressure. Learning has a lot to do with our natural gifts and more to do with our environment and obstacles to overcome and growth mindset. So if we're able to overcome the obstacles and we have a positive growth mindset, we're likely to learn better in that environment. And then the last one is fear is the number, number one reason we fail to learn. And number two might be boredom. If kids are bored and they're not enjoying the session, they oftentimes don't learn. Okay. So here's an example. Here's an athlete that I had. This was the very first session. This was my fault. I gave her too much information on her arm action and watch what happens. See, her arms got messed up. So you can see as she comes out, her arm action got delayed. And look at the, look at the arm action here. It's all confused. And that was my fault. I just gave her too much information, okay? What is an athlete's most important skill? Okay, the most important skill of an athlete is reading. Their ability to read situations. But you can see in this first picture, all these athletes are learning how to read this soccer ball coming at them. Okay, and in this one, look at these three players and even these players back here. They are looking at the ball. What could potentially happen for them to have to move in a specific direction? Okay, that's called reading. The more they get experience and more they get exposure, the better they are at reading. Okay, the, br the brain is designed to solve problems. Okay, it's designed to learn through the solving of problems. So this chart kind of gives you an idea of if we can identify the problem, develop an alternative to that problem, select the best alternative, implement that alternative, and then did the solution work, yes or no? And then we go through it again. And that's how learning occurs for uh, athletes. Okay, when learning is occurring, synapses in the brain are firing. Those are the pathways that make what we've learned very clean, very smooth. Memories of patterns in sequences are being stored. So every time we get exposed to something, and if we put a lot of emphasis and we practice that, it's going to store in our memory. If we don't, it'll be pruned away and we won't, we won't uh, remember it. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about is feedback strategies. And I like summary feedback. So summary feedback is this, have a guided talk with the athlete, ask them questions and see if they are understanding. And then ask them to tell you what they felt about the last attempt. So by using summary feedback, you're asking the athlete to tell you what they just felt during that skill or during that repetition. That way you have an idea. Is, is the athlete actually feeling what they should or, or is the skill making sense to them? So if you just tell them everything, they never get a chance to express how they really feel about it. So you got to give them a chance to tell how they feel. Feedback opportunities. Here's a, here's a perfect example. So sometimes what happens is we might have an athlete that does five repetitions very well, okay? And they do one rep wrong, all right? Compliment on how well they're doing because they did five things really well. Compliment that. Don't worry about the one they did wrong because maybe they just had a bad rep. They slipped or something went wrong. On the other hand, if they did one rep correct and five wrong, that's when you want to interject with some summary feedback. Say, hey, what are you feeling? Why are you, uh, what do you feel like 
uh, is not working really well or what is working really well. And they'll tell you most of the time. They'll tell you, I just don't, it just doesn't feel right or my grip on the ball wasn't good or whatever it may be. Okay, when an athlete is reading their environment, uh, they are learning what to do. So if you watch this, here's a basketball player. Watch these players. Look at them read. See, she's reading what's going on. Look at her look back. Okay, now look at this girl. She's looking all over the place, moving, trying to find out where to go. So all these players are reading what to do based on past experiences. And that's very important to understand. Let me back this up real quick. Again, if we look, if we look at this player right here that I just circled, watch her, watch her move. Okay, runs to the ball, she looks in, she kind of helps a little bit. Watch her, her earlier. Okay, again, this girl right here. You can see she's all over the place. She's reading everything that's going on. She's getting in position. Okay, and that's how they learn. That's how the game is learned. Okay. All right. Three prim primary acts that take place during uh, skill actions are. So during a skill action. So the three primary acts that take place during a skill action are. Number one, they want to see it and then read it. What are they seeing? Number two, immediately they're going to have to solve it. They're going to have a plan that's going to develop in their head. Uh, number three is they're going to act on it. They're going to do the skill. And it happens like that. They see it, they plan it, they do it. Right up. Boom, boom, boom. It's that fast. Okay? The more exposure they get to it, the better these three things occur. Young, beginning athletes, inexperienced athletes struggle with this. Experienced athletes do this very quickly. Okay, so now in this right here, we have many training sessions involve lots of doing, but not much reading. So these athletes are running through these, these um, poles, okay? They don't have to think a lot about it. They just have to get through them. They know where they're going to go. Same thing. This we call a T drill. The athlete runs forward shuffles over here, shuffles over here, shuffles back, and then backpedals. They don't have to overthink or read. They just do the drill. Not that this drill can't be helpful, but they're not learning how to read their environment of play very well. Okay. Oh, here's a funny picture. My brain isn't learning. Okay, so these two dumb and dumber here. My brain's not learning, right? or my brain is bored, okay? My brain just, you know, it's too easy. There's nothing there to challenge my brain, so I'm bored. All right. Regressing a skill to enhance the posture or positions, okay? So now we're gonna go to skill learning. So a corrective is what I call how we fix something, how we help improve a skill, okay? So a corrective should be used to increase the advantage of a correct posture or position. So if you have an athlete that is in bad posture or bad position, develop a drill to teach them how to get in better position, okay? Uh, athlete can deliver the skill safely and close to the model of that movement pattern, right? So we wanna have something that looks like that actual skill. So whatever corrective we're using, it wants to look like that skill. Now, that's pretty important to understand. Okay, so here's fundamentals of skill acquisition. This is how skills get developed. So we have on the bottom a novice. Okay, they don't have any experience. Then we have a beginner. They can start to get a little bit of experience by doing this, and then competent means they're capable of understanding the actions in terms of long-range goals. Proficient is someone that perceives situations as holes rather than in terms of aspects, okay? So they can see the game develop much better. And then an expert takes it to the next level. They, don't, they can just look at something really quick and act very fast. During the beginning stages, Blocked or explicit forms of learning are important because blocked would mean if I told an athlete to shoot baskets, basketball, 
And I said, I want you to stand next to the basket and shoot 10 shots from that same spot. That's blocked training. Eventually, they're going to have to do random training, which means they can shoot close to the basket, then far, and then medium, and then off to the right, off to the left. And they have to be able to adapt quickly because that's how the game's played. All right. So once the skills are acquired and reading becomes the most important skill for the athletes to master, that's when we have to do more random type training. But early on, when they're first learning the skill, blocked is fine. Okay. Here's an example. What do we see now becomes what we do. All right. What we see now becomes what we do. So these two athletes here are seeing this girl getting ready to hit. They saw the ball get set over here, so they move, and now they're up in a block. These players down here, okay, so this number eight and this number five and even this number two, they're waiting to see what's going to happen. They're reading the block. If it gets blocked, then this player has to be able to dig it. If it gets tipped, this player has to be able to get to it. And if it goes behind them, then the player's in the back will play. That's all about reading, okay? Let's dive into the seven patterns now. We talked about learning, okay? That first part was all about learning how we read, how a skill gets developed, how we become a better athlete, okay? Now, let's dive into the patterns or the models of these seven patterns that help us actually move better, okay? So one thing we want to do is establish a model of how the pattern is ideally performed. So how do we sprint? Sprinting is a pattern. How do we do that? We're going to talk about that model. And then how about the variations of those models? Okay, because each sport has a variation of each of these models. So if I sprint in track and field, that looks different than if I sprint in volleyball. Okay, which I don't get up to high speeds in volleyball, right? So, all the different patterns, the seven is linear acceleration, sprinting, lateral shuffle, seen in basketball, lateral run, back pedal, a hip turn, and a jump. Okay, here's an example of acceleration. Okay, so if we watch this athlete in this model, look at, we got a really big arm action. We've got really nice, let me back it up. We got good leg separation. Look at right here. Separate from here to here. We got really good push off in a straight line, good arm action, good front knee position, and then she's gonna push down and back with this leg. That's the model we want for acceleration. Here's another girl doing it who's working on pushing further ahead. So let's take a look at this. So as she gets set, she's going to launch herself out. Look at this big separation of the legs and arms. And now she drives down and back and continues that as she runs, okay? That's the basic model of Staggered stance acceleration. Okay, here's another one. This athlete, okay, oh, excuse me, this athlete right here, if we want, oh, let me go back. This athlete right here, as he accelerates, it's very short. Okay, look at his legs, very close together, not much separation. Okay, it doesn't help him. And look at right here. Look at it doesn't get much separation at all. So we come up with a strategy to help him. So rather than having him down in this stance to learn, we're going to get him up in a higher stance. So let me come over here now. Watch. So he starts up and he rocks. Now look at the separation. Okay. Look at the difference in those legs separating right there. And look at that, much, much better than this separation. So that strategy of getting him up helped him and have that little roll that he uses, he rocks back and then he pushes, helped him be able to separate. So using a, that's what I call a corrective exercise, okay? This second video, 
this video is a corrective to the skill of acceleration for him. Okay. All right. And now here's we here we have an athlete that the coach told him to never step back before he goes forward. It's what I call a plyo step. And watch how it hurts this athlete. Watch this athlete try to take off. See how when he initially goes to take off, look at look at he does. He has to rock. He's trying to gain some hamstring tension so he can finally get forward and then have an angle. So he's trying to get this angle right here. But if he was allowed to just reposition his foot, he wouldn't have to do that. He'd be able to be much quicker. Okay. Now let's break down the model of sprinting. Here's a pretty good sprinter. She's a high school girl, but she has a couple limitations we want to work on. Okay. So watch. Okay, so let's look right here. She, like right about here, is in mid-stance phase. This foot is flat on the ground. So we're going to call that mid-stance. This leg is late. Her knee in mid-stance, in my model of sprinting, this knee should be already out here. So she should be right there when this foot is here. So she's late, okay? So teaching her not to be so dominant on the backside. And this is what I mean by backside, watch. See this right here? She's stuck way back behind her. The leg gets stuck way behind. And you can see it right there. Look at, and what happens is she starts to arch her back and she's getting into too much extension on the back side. This leg should be somewhere around here, and this part of her leg should be up like this, okay? It should be higher so she can pull straight through, all right? Her arm action isn't bad, all right? This collapses a little bit too much. This is pretty good, her back arm action, but I do like that. She gets a long action to match this opposite leg. But again, see this leg is very late. Her cleats are facing the sky and I would rather her not be in that position at that time, okay? So you can see how she's way, way, look at this, way stuck back here. She has to be able to not let that leg go so far back, right? Okay, so now, that was pattern number uh, two. We, we did acceleration and then we did sprinting. Now we're gonna go into the lateral shuffle. This is called a W concept, okay? I'm gonna show you other pictures or videos of the shuffle, but this is a basic breakdown. So what we see here is we've got, it looks like a W, okay? In, in, in um, our alphabet, we have the W. If we tip the W on the side, we get this, these angles right here. Okay, and that looks kind of like, like this W if we tipped it over. But what we want to see is as this athlete, you know, let me kind of get here first. Okay, so as this athlete starts to take off and push, you'll notice that the, she maintains this angle. Okay, this, this angle right here. Okay, that gets maintained. See right there, that's what we're looking at, where those red lines are. So as she pushes, her back angle stays the same and the lower body straightens out. That's what keeps her low during the shuffle so she doesn't rise up too much. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Here is a live shuffle. Here, push off. Okay, let's watch it again. All right, so if we watch, what we do is we get a push with the back leg. Foot is perpendicular, facing the direction that we're facing, right? She gets this 
force from this foot up through the front shoulder. The front side leg opens so she can pull with her heel. Watch. She pulls, well, let me get back here. See, she hits her heel and now she pulls. As she pulls, that allows her to recover the back leg and they meet under her hips. And then she's able to push again, reach out and pull with her heel again. And then she recovers, okay? And then she does the same thing coming back. That's the model of the lateral shuffle, the basic pattern. It changes based on sport. Somebody who does fencing, badminton, um, maybe tennis, uh, uh, you know, soccer might do it differently, but this is the basic model, okay? All right. So here's the model of the lateral gait cycle. You can see how their feet meet together as they push. So we push with the backside leg, we extend the front leg out, and we pull. As they pull, and the backside leg recovers back, and the front side leg finishes under the hips, that's why we see these three athletes with their legs close together, okay? And then they continue that gait cycle. And here it is again. Now they push off his back leg, push off the back leg, front side opens up, they dig with their heel. Look at, he's pushing off, front side opens up, and he's going to dig with his heel. All right, and so that's the shuffle. That's the lateral shuffle. Now let me show you the pattern called the hip turn, okay? The hip turn is when we are facing forward and then we have to turn and go backwards the other way. We're going to flip our hips around. Notice this athlete's feet. So watch. As she turns, see she repositions her feet to be able to push off. Okay, so if we come back here, she creates this angle to be able to push off. Now, I would like her shoulders out in front a little bit more, but for the most part, you can see she pushes off, opens the front side, and then that allows her to be able to push down and back here and then start running. So that is a hip turn, facing one direction, quickly flipping the hips around, and then pushing away to go in a new direction. Okay, here is an example of the hip turn. Here's a tennis player. She's training. Watch her. See her hip turn? Right there. And that gets her back to hit her back in. Okay? Now watch. Here she is doing it more aggressively. Bigger steps. So this, this action, there's the hip turn, and then that action right there is what we call a lateral run. I'm going to show you more of that in a video in a minute. And then she goes in, she comes back, hip turns. See, she turns, pushes off, and then performs the hip. So that is the pattern of a hip turn, and then she goes into a lateral run. Okay, here we go again. Here's a fun way to get them to do this lateral run. Watch these athletes chase the ball. That action right there, laterally run. Okay, so they're doing, or what I would call a directional step. Okay, now watch this. Look at all of them did the same thing. Look at them, the push, open, and then push. Watch. Push, open, they open the front side, and then they laterally run across. All right, let's show you again. Okay, now watch this. This is a perfect example of it. Watch. Okay, so that was a lateral run into a shuffle gather. So watch. She shuffles back. She sees me point. See, she's reading me. Look at her eyes. As soon as she sees me, look at her push, push, open, and now she's going to run across her body, right there, look at, runs across her body, 
And then she does a shuffle gather. She comes back. Look at now I pointed back again. So she, her change of direction is with this leg. That allows this leg to open and she can run back. And there it is. But look at her upper body. So your upper body is staying facing forward. That's why we call it a lateral run on that early step. Okay. All right. Good. Okay, here, is it. here it is again. These two athletes are going to compete against one another with resistance. So this would be a corrective. What we're trying to do is improve the strength in their closest leg to the band, to the attachment. This leg has to push harder, but they're going to use the lateral run again. See, I'm pushing open, push open, and then they laterally run. And they're competing against one another. All right, great drill. Here's another tennis player. Watch. Look at him laterally run. Look at him push. So he goes split step. Look at look at him open the front side. Push off the left leg, open the right leg, and then run across. Push, open. And watch how he pushes down and back. That allows this leg, by opening this leg, that allows his back leg to have a pathway to get through. That's part of our model of the lateral run. We have to have that pathway. Okay. Let's go into jumping. That's one of our last patterns, right? So now we have different types of gathering. This athlete here on top, the taller athlete, is very much hip dominant. She uses her hips more. This, this girl is a volleyball player. This girl is a basketball player, okay? They're just a little different. This one loads more on her hips. This one mo loads more using her quads or her thighs to, to jump, okay? So here, you can kind of get a little, a little look. Let me move it forward. So you can see how the loading and the landing, all right? You can see this top athlete up here, look at the knees. We don't want that. This athlete down here maintains really good knee position, all right? And then over here, what we have is an example of a corrective exercise to train the plyometric action of a jump. So here we have her jumping off six inches, and then here off 20 inches. And watch what happens when we do this, okay? So the top one, look at her, how quick the jump is, and the feet immediately as she leaves, coil, get the, she pushes off hard because she doesn't have as much energy coming off six inches. So she has to use a lot of push. She plantar flexes those ankles and pushes to land up. Now on this bottom one, you're going to notice a difference. As soon as she hits coming off 20 inches, it's a lot more elastic. So when she hits, you'll notice, look at the difference in the angles of the top and the bottom. Big difference in the energy. So if you want your athletes to develop more of that plyometric, when they jump off something that's a little bit higher, the, the, the elastic energy of the Achilles tendon and the muscles becomes much higher versus when they jump off something lower, they have to find energy themselves to do that. Okay. All right. So let me talk about the concept of repositioning. This is huge for multi-directional speed. Basically what it means, when one leg repositions in plants out from underneath the center of the body, so it plants wider than the body, it allows there to be stiffness in the tendons and the muscles, and that makes the athlete move quicker. It allows them to produce a lot of force, and it makes them stiffer so they can be quicker off the ground. It also produces an angle in the opposite direction of the way they want to travel. So if they want to go to their left, 
they're going to reposition to the right, and that will push them to the left. Right? So let me give you an idea of this. Watch. Notice when these two athletes move, watch their legs. This girl is the leader in the black shirt. This girl in the red is following her. Okay, notice, see the repositioning? So look at, look at this, it's off the ground. She sees her ready to plant, so what does she do? She plants, okay? And then she goes a little more, and then she plants again. But it's always, watch this leg. Right there, see, she goes from here, and she repositions wider. If she used that foot plant, She's in a bad position. This goes back to the correctives to be able to change directions. All right, so this is a really, really important skill to be able to have. They reposition their feet to be able to move. Okay, here's another example. You're gonna see this athlete watching me, so she's reacting to her environment, me, and she's gonna perform hip turns, lateral runs, shuffle, change the directions, and it's all based on my command. Okay, notice all the repositionings that occurred. There's a hip turn, hip turn, push. Now look at her open the front leg. That allows this back leg to be able to go through. That's the lateral run. Okay, she comes back. Now watch this. Look at the reposition of this leg to stop. Look at that. Here to here. Here to here to change direction. And there's the stiffness I'm talking about. Stiff right there. That allows her to bounce back to the middle. And there it is again. Very stiff. That allows her to get back to the middle. And look at the reposition, reposition, push, open, okay? Oop. Open the front leg, and that allows the back leg to get through. Okay. So challenge athleticism through decision making. Read it, organize it, and then do it. That's what we just saw, okay? Now, what I'm going to show you now is a video of my two daughters doing some drills. Okay, we call these tier two and tier three. So tier two means the athlete doesn't know which way they're gonna go and they're not sure when. So they're not gonna know until I toss the ball. Once I toss the ball, then they'll go get it, whatever one I toss. You can tell I have two tennis balls with me. A tier three means they're gonna make a change of direction with it. Okay, so you're gonna see it. I'm gonna let this play and I'll kind of talk through it. So notice her arm action. She does a good job of using her arms to go and chase the ball once she recognizes. See her reposition her feet? So now watch this daughter who's younger. She doesn't use her arms very well to run. She's just trying to reach and catch and see how. So we would use correctives for her for acceleration because she needs to use it. Now this is a tier three. So she's changing directions twice. Okay, she's going in one direction and then another. Go there and then find out where I put it and go get the next ball, okay? So I think we're gonna get another one here. Watch her reposition her feet. Look at reposition, reposition, and then hustle. That's what we're looking for, okay? Now, one of the biggest things you can do for your athletes is put them in, put them in positions to learn how to read another athlete's movement. So on this drill right here, I have a bunch of cones set up. And I'm gonna start them both in the middle cones. The, the, my daughter in the yellow shirt, her goal is to get past this line back here. My daughter with the gray shirt, her job is to tag her. So she's got a reader. So I'm gonna start them here and then you'll notice I'm gonna start moving them around so this daughter in the green, or the gray shirt, has to read what the other daughter is doing. She has to be able to tag her, so watch. Okay, she's gonna break down and then tag her. Okay, now I move them 
to different cones. So now she's going to chase her again. Oop, sorry, that kind of. So she's chasing her and then still be able to catch her, okay? And then now they both go to different cones, okay? So now what happens is this athlete has an advantage to go straight. This athlete has to hustle. But she's got to be ready for a change of direction. So watch. See, she cuts back. And so she has to be able to break down and be able to go with her. All right, so that's a different one. And now watch. Now it's even a different challenge. All right, so see, look at She breaks down as where my daughter in the yellow shirt is trying to fake her out. And then we go to the other side. Okay, so that gives you an idea of how we can take an athlete, we can develop their basic seven movement patterns, we can do that and teach them the skills, the pattern through learning. Okay, we're going to understand how we learn, how athletes react to it, how to get feedback. So if an athlete's not performing well, we want to ask them questions using summary feedback. Just some, ask them what do they feel. That's really important for them to be able to develop the ability to tell you what they're feeling. And then that lets me know what I need to do next, okay? So in summary, first of all, thank you for letting me share this with you. But in summary, Understand how athletes learn. Okay, reading is a huge component. Athletes get better the more they have a chance to read in their environment, the more they get to see things. Number two, establish foundational patterns so greater versatility can be born, which means if they can do those seven patterns of acceleration, sprinting, shuffling, lateral run, back pedal, hip turn, and then vertical jump, all the variations, if they can do those really well, there's really not much they can't do athletically. They can do any of those patterns really well, okay? The last thing is allow the process to be enjoyable and include the athletes in it. So don't dominate by telling them what to do all the time. Sometimes you've got to see what they need and ask them what it is that they need so that you can help them, okay? So um, I want to thank you uh, for the opportunity uh, to share this information. Um, hopefully it was helpful. If I can help at all, feel free to contact me. And, and if you would like, you know, please you feel free to use these videos to, to kind of study. And hopefully it helps you understand a little bit better about um, how athletes should move and how we can break down these patterns. Okay, so I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I wish the best for all of you. Thank you now. Lee Tuft 呢，是我比较喜欢的一位教练啊，因为他这个今天选择的这个主题呢是七个动作模式。啊，其实这个这个内容呢，对我们的青少年来讲呢，我觉得是非常好的，呃，一个练习的内容啊。我们大家其实可以在，尤其是针对基于地面的这些运动项目里，啊，这个足球、网球、呃、篮球，啊，甚至排球啊，那这些项目当中，其实在进行正式的这个，呃，这个项目技能的学习之前啊，我觉得咱们的。孩子们是可以在早期的时候就针对这七个呃动作啊模式啊这个进行啊专门性的或者是具有这个娱乐性的这种练习或者是游戏啊，实际上是能够让他帮助他们能够更好的在场上去完成呃这个不同的运动任务。那这里面我觉得他提到的几点也是非常重要的啊，其中一个方面就是这个 reading 啊，也就是阅读啊，其实我们很多时候。我们看到了，在小年龄段啊，我们的教练员在组织训练的时候呢，呃，进行的都是大量的啊，这个没有阅读的这种啊，呃，封闭式的这种运动任务啊，比如说进行绳梯的练习啊，比如说针对啊固定的这个标志筒、标志盘的这个嗯练习啊，其实这些练习呢，嗯，在
一定程度上啊，是可以帮助到我们孩子进行这个呃脚步训练的。但是呢，随着他们对于这种任务的这个逐渐熟悉之后，那这类练习呢就渐渐失去了啊，对于他们认知方面的这种挑战。所以呢，这类练习慢慢的可能就变成什么呢？就退化成是一种热身脑，他没办法真的是帮助孩子们能够在运动场上进行这样一个运动表现上面这种迁移。啊，我们其实应该把更多的这种开放式的，啊，这些练习呢，能够去融合在我们的移动类的练习当中，啊，使他们能够通过视觉啊，通过听觉啊，甚至通过啊一些事件啊，来进行这种啊，我们称之为叫灵敏的练习，啊，所以我觉得今天的这个 TAFT 的这个切入点啊，非常适合我们的青少年的这个方面的训练啊。呃，我并不是说不赞成大家采用这种绳梯类的这种练习进行脚步训练，但实际上这类练习做到后面，第一，它就已经失去了这个呃趣味性啊，失去了很多的挑战性啊，导致很多孩子我会发现他们在进行这类练习的时候呢，就专注度会非常下非常低啊，也就是他们的注意力会下降啊，而且呢，他们做的一些都是重复类的这种呃动作，所以呢。呃，真正的能够帮助他们在场上进行这样一些呃运专项技能的学习的时候呢，可能就会啊、呃、这类练习可能就起不到呃这个帮助啊，所以我希望大家的这个教练员，尤其是从事这个青训的这些教练员，能够去呃开发出自己啊，在这个七个动作模式基础上啊，开发出属于自己的这个呃带有阅读性的这个呃内容的啊灵敏训练。